What's up, Northridge Church? Good morning. Welcome home and welcome to the family. It's great to gather as the family of God to, to open God's word and to bring him praise. And so thanks for joining us this morning. You know, about a year and a half ago, I was packing my suitcases to get ready to travel to Israel to shoot a sermon series for our church and for Right Now Media. And any time I travel for my job, it has a a, a way of kind of uh, taking its toll on on me and my wife. You know, being gone for anywhere from 8 to 12 days across the globe obviously puts pressure on my wife because she's got to take care of our our four kids. She's got to make every meal. She's got to put the kids to bed every single night. And honestly, when you're, you're overseas over for eight days, man, I genuinely just long to be with my wife and my kids. And so there's no better feeling when you travel knowing, hey, mission accomplished, we got the footage and the series is done, and we're packing our bags and we're getting ready to go home. Going to get to see my kids and my wife. And so when we pack our bags on trips like that, and I, I, I pack them up, we get on that long flight, I have a tendency to, to build a little bit of an expectation of what that moment's going to be like when I see my family. You know, when I walk in, in the doors, my kids are going to run to me. They're going to tackle me with kisses. They're like, Daddy's home. My wife's going to come give me a big smooch. It's been eight to ten days. We're, we're going to have a, a good night, be intimate. It's going to be awesome. And so, you know... I pack my bags, I'm tired from a long journey, I get on the plane, a 12-hour flight, one more flight, I get in my car, and I come home, and I open the doors to my house, and there goes Baylor in a diaper with food all over his face, there's toys everywhere, and my wife comes up to me, she gives me a big kiss, she says, I'm going to Starbucks, I I want to need some peace and quiet, the kids are all yours, (laughs) and I'm like... Wait, wait, what, what just happened? Like, this is not the way that I saw it going. This is not the picture I had in my head. And you know what happens in, in a moment like that? My mind begins to wonder. My head begins to ask questions like this. I, I've been gone for 12 days. Did my wife even miss me? Like, honestly, like, did she even think about me? Did she even know I was gone? Like, was she just so busy with the chaos? She didn't even recognize, wait, Drew left? Or, you know what, maybe, maybe I think, you know, is she just glad I'm home because I can help with the chores, the cooking, changing of diapers? And it leads me to a place to wonder, does my wife even desire me? Does she long for me? We've all been there before. Where we experienced a moment where our expectations met reality and it caused our, our mind in relationship to wonder certain questions. And I think sometimes we fail to realize how much our minds impact every relationship that we have. That what we think affects our relationships with our spouse and our coworkers and our roommates and our classmates. That what we think matters. And that's what we've been doing over the last couple of weeks is we've been in this journey, in this series called Minefield. Where we've been exploring the power and the significance and the impact your mind has. That what you think, that what sits in your head ultimately has the ability to change who you are and the reality you experience. And throughout this journey, as we continue in this series, one thing that I want us to see is how your mind impacts almost every area of your life. Today, we're going to talk about the impact your mind has on your relationships. In fact, I would say like this. Anytime you experience relational tension... Right, relational tension, whether it's with your spouse, your parents, your coworker, your boss, anytime you run into relational tension, it's ultimately just a reflection of a lack of peace right here in your mind. Because that relational tension didn't start with the words you say, it doesn't start with the actions you take, it starts with what you think in your mind. 
So when it comes to our relationships, we, we should know what the Bible says, that we should be after. No matter what relationship we are experiencing, we should know what the Bible wants for our relationships. And the apostle Paul makes it abundantly clear. He talks to two different churches about how important and what our relationships are and what we should chase after to the church at Ephesus and the church in Rome. Let's start with the church at Ephesus in Ephesians. He says this to believers. He says, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make Every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. So Paul, to the church in Ephesus, to Christians just like you and I, he says you should, your life should be worthy of the calling of Jesus over it. And what that looks like is that you're going to be patient, you're going to be gentle, you're going to be kind, you're going to bear with one another's issues. And he says this, he says make every effort to keep unity in your relationships. So the church in Rome, a totally different place. Paul almost says the exact same thing. Romans chapter 12, he says, do not repay evil, anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far it depends on you, in your relationships, live at peace with everyone. So Paul makes it clear to two different churches, to believers, that we should strive for peace in our relationships, and peace is ultimately unity in those relationships. He says you should make every effort, everything you do should, to be, to, should fight for unity no matter the relationship. Now, here's the truth. In our relationships, I think we could all agree that there are some that don't feel really unified right now, where it's a struggle. And I think what we often miss out on what is causing that disunity. I think we often blame the lack of disunity in our marriage or in our relationship with our roommates or our parents. We, we blame it on the actions that they or I took. We blame it on the words that we say in those relationships, but I would beg to differ. I believe unity in your relationships starts with what you think in your head. Before you ever had an argument, before you ever had any discord in that relationship, guess where it started? With the way you thought. The thoughts that sit in your head. And so how do we achieve uh, relational unity? Well, I think the first thing we got to do is we have to understand some of the misconceptions, some of the lies that we believe in our mind when it comes to relationships. I want to talk about two today. The first one is we, we, we bought the lie that unity means no disagreements. That in my relationships with people, in order for me to achieve unity in my marriage, in, in my relationships with family and friends and coworkers, that, that I have to somehow live in a life that we, we don't disagree on anything. And isn't that kind of how our culture is moving? Over the last 10 years, our culture has, has begun to slowly drip in our minds that if you disagree with someone, you cancel them. If you disagree with someone, you disassociate with them. That's the way our culture is going. But honestly, how shallow of relationships are they? If we can't come together despite our disagreements, when Paul says make every effort to keep the unity, he's not saying make every effort to live with people who agree with what you agree with. He's not saying unity is uniformity, that we all somehow, when we follow Jesus, we all just get in some line and we all think the same way. Can I tell you today, you can be friends with someone who has different political views than you. Imagine that. Can I tell you today, you can be friends with someone who has different religious views than you. Heck, let's take it to another notch. You can be a Bills fan and still like Chiefs fans. <laughs> Unity doesn't mean we lack disagreements, but our disagreements make us stronger together. 
The second misconception that we believe in our mind about relationships and unity is that conflict is a barrier to unity. I think one area in our life and in our minds that we need to renew is our perspective on conflict. Because when we hear that word conflict, we immediately cringe. If I were to say that you have conflict in your marriage with your parents, with your boss, you immediately view it as negative. But can I tell you today, conflict is actually neutral. It's how you respond to it which makes it lean one way or the other. That God actually brings conflict into our lives to bring unity in our relationships. Isn't that true today? You know, every once in a while, I get the joy of doing premarital counseling with a couple that I am uh, getting ready to marry. And I love young couples because they're just so excited to, to be married. Like love conquers all. And you're like, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and they're so excited. They're like, oh, nothing can get in our way. And part of premarital counseling is like introduce conflict. So you actually have to talk about serious things like money and sex. And so, you know, you see all the excitement. We can't wait to get married. I'm like, oh, yeah, hey, when you get married, Christmas is coming up. Whose family are you going to spend with? Oh, mine, mine for sure. Here comes some conflict. (laughs) And what's amazing is actually talking about hard things in our relationships. Having disagreements actually can make our relationships stronger. Conflict is not a barrier to unity. Conflict, I believe, responded in the right way, in a right mindset, can actually make our marriages and our relationships with our parents and all the relationships that we experience stronger. But we view it as a negative thing. Paul says in your relationships... No matter the cost, go for unity. Live at peace with everyone. But what is causing the lack of peace in our relationships? Well, again, I I think it starts right here in our mind with the expectations we have in those relationships. I'll talk about three. The first type of expectation that shatters our mind is unspoken expectations. In in all kinds of relationships, we have expectations for people that sit in our head that we've never communicated. Come on, if we're honest, we all have these. We have these with our neighbors. We have an expectation that they will take care of their house and and their lawn, but we never told them that, but we're sure going to hold them accountable to it. We have these type of expectations in our marriage. We just expect that our spouse will, 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 will serve a certain role in the marriage. Maybe we haven't even communicated that to them, but we're going to hold them accountable to it. We have these types of expectations. We haven't spoken to our boss, but we, we have an expectation that our boss will treat us right, will make certain decisions, will lead and, and, and be a good boss. We, we haven't communicated that to them, but they sit in our head. And all of these unspoken expectations that sit in our mind that we haven't communicated, when they are shattered, guess what it causes? Relational tension. The second kind of expectation is disputed or clashing expectations. These are the type of expectations that we have in our head, that we've communicated with that person we're in relationship with, but we see it differently. We, we, we don't a- agree on which way is best. We have a lot of these types of expectations with our boss, right? We disagree on how, how many hours I should work in a week. We have them in our marriages, like how much vacation we should take or what we should spend our money on or how often we should have sex or how we should parent our children. We have them every Sunday with, with our spouse, like on how much football I should be able to watch on Sunday. Well, it crosses a little bit of relational tension, doesn't it? We have it with our moms and our dads of how often you should be able to see your grandkids. These are expectations that we've communicated that we don't see eye to eye on. The third type of expectations are broken expectations. These are expectations that we have communicated, we've agreed upon, but someone chose to go a different direction. Right? These are expectations like in our relationships, we agreed that we would always be honest with each other, but then you lied to me expectations in our marriage that that we would be faithful to one another and then you cheated 
Expectations at work that you would show up on time. We agreed upon it, and yet you're constantly late for everything. Expectations about being a grandparent. You can't wait to be with your kids. You said I'd be able to to spend time with, with my grandkids, but I ask and you constantly say no. Expectations as kids that you would be a father and yet you abandoned our family. And every single one of these expectations that we have in our heads and in our minds, when they are broken, when they are shattered, guess what it does? It fills our minds with thoughts. Thoughts like, do they even care about me? Thoughts like, why can't they see it my way? Thoughts like, they don't understand me. Will this ever work? And all of these thoughts lead to relational tension, arguments, fights in every and any kind of relationship. And so the question we have is how do we win the battle in our minds when it impacts our relationships? Well, I would challenge you when your mind is filled with those thoughts, We use those strategies that we've been talking about each and every week of this series. Strategies that we will continue to talk about, that we ingrain them in our heads so they begin to help us repair our thoughts. And so the first strategy is that we would observe and examine our thoughts in our head. That we would know exactly what we are thinking about the relational tension or the hurt that we're experiencing in our relationships. And not only do we need to not know know what's in our head and know the thoughts that we're thinking, but we have to evaluate them. We have to ask the question, are these thoughts helping me? Or are they hurting me? Are they truthful? Are they appropriate? And when it comes to relational tension, I'm going to give you seven questions you should ask. These are in your notes. They're not going to be on the screen. Seven questions you should ask when you experience relational tension. When you feel the hurt of a relationship, you should ask yourself, is this a one-time offense? Or is this a pattern of hurtful behavior? When you feel that relational tension, ask yourself, am I focusing on my needs being met or am I trusting God is at work in this relationship, especially in me? Ask yourself, how significant is the impact of this offense on me and others? When you feel that tension, is this a preference thing or is this a right or wrong situation? Ask yourself, how did you play a role in this offense? Ask yourself, have I communicated my expectations for that person I'm struggling with? And am I able to overlook this offense or am I still unsettled? Every single one of those questions helps you evaluate and observe and examine your thoughts. And that leads us to the second strategy, the most important strategy. When you have unwanted, uncontrollable thoughts, when you observe and you examine them, you take them to the Lord. You pray your thoughts. This is why Paul says to the church in Philippi, he says, don't be anxious about anything. Can you imagine if we weren't anxious about our marriage? Can you imagine if you would be able to stop worrying about your relationship with your coworker or your parents or your kids? Paul said you don't have to be anxious or worried about those relationships. He says, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, present your requests to God. And so when we are having relational conflict, relational tension, we bring it to God. We say, God, would you help me heal from the hurt of this relationship? God, would you, would you restore this relationship that seems to have so much tension? God, would you help me be able to see this person's side of the story? Because right now I can't seem to see it. God, would you actually help the person who hurt me? Can you imagine praying that prayer? Asking God to help the person who hurt you in a relationship? God, would you walk with me through this journey? You know what I love about God? Is he's always available. You know, in our human relationships, one of the most frustrating things is to need somebody. Right? You need your spouse. You pick up the phone and you call and they don't answer. You pick up the phone, you call your best friend, and they don't answer. Can I tell you today, God always answers. He's always available. 
No matter what time it is, what time zone you're in, God is always ready and available. In fact, he asks you, he says, cast your cares and your anxieties on me because I care for you. And so we have to learn with our thoughts and our relational discord and conflict to take it to God. Because when we take it to God, it allows us to be able to rest our thoughts. One way you rest your thoughts is realizing that God's in control and you aren't. That God's the one who can heal that relationship, you aren't. And that's exactly what God says to us. What does he say in Matthew chapter 11? This is Jesus' words. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. Do you know what wears us out, burdens us? Is the constant barrage of our thoughts. You know what wears us out? It's the constant thinking, will my marriage ever make it? Will it ever be healthy? You know what wears us out? Like, does my boss really like me? Am I ever gonna make it in this company? You know what wears us out? Do my parents even understand me? Do my kids even get what I'm saying? Jesus says, when you feel that weariness and burdensome, come to me and I'll give you rest. A rest is not that you stop thinking It's that you stop thinking on the 75% of thoughts in our mind that are negative. You stop telling yourself that your marriage isn't going to make it. You stop telling yourself you're a failure. You stop telling yourself the negativity and you allow God to fill your mind with thoughts that are true and noble. Thoughts that are praiseworthy and excellent. You stop filling your heads with the replaying how, what they did to you or what they said to you. You stop trying to figure out how to win the argument in that relationship and you just give your mind a break. So when we know what's in our heads and we evaluate it, when we take it to God, he allows us to rest ultimately so we can begin to repair what's in our heads to repair our thoughts, and when it comes to relational discord and conflict, in order to truly repair your thoughts, you have to ask yourself two questions. The first question, when relationship tension comes in your marriage with your coworker, you gotta ask yourself, can I overlook this offense? Did you know that when someone hurts you, it's actually a biblical principle in certain times to be able to overlook the hurt they brought upon you? That we should be mature enough Christ followers that when someone hurts us, we can forgive and not hold them accountable. I mean, look what the Bible says, First Peter, it says, above all, love each other deeply. Why? Because your love for that person covers over a multitude of sins. Ephesians 4, it says, be completely humble, gentle, patience, because you're going to have to bear with one another in relationships. Proverbs 19, it says, a person's wisdom yields patience because it's to one's glory to overlook an offense. There's times where people hurt you, you can just let it go. You don't have to allow it to fill your mind and your head over and over again. And you want to know how, why we can do that? It's because over and over again, God overlooks our offenses. Think about just this week. How many times you offended God, but his grace and his mercy from the cross overlooked your sin and your shame, and he says it's gone from the east to the west. And we don't have to hold everything against everyone because God didn't hold everything against us. And so you got to ask yourself, can I just overlook this? Can I forgive and forget? And one of the ways you know that is as if it can leave your head. If you can get it outside of your head, let it go. But the second question is, if it can't leave your head, do I need to address this offense? If someone hurts you relationally and you can't get over it, you got to talk about it. You got to explain your expectations. You got to talk about the things that are bothering you. And we don't do that out of malice or anger or bitterness. We do that in love. We go to that person, we speak the truth in love. Jesus models that for us. Jesus wasn't afraid to tell people harsh realities, but he always did it with grace 
and truth. In fact, look what the Bible says. It says, Ephesians chapter four, it says, instead of speaking the truth, he says, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. Here's the reality for all of us. We live in relationships. We were created to live in relationships. But for many of us, instead of fighting for unity and peace, What we experience is disunity, conflict, and arguments. And what we have to realize today is before that argument ever came, before that frustration ever came, before that action ever took place, it started right here. And so if we, as mature Christians, can win the battle with our thoughts, it might actually just save and protect the relationships that we hold dearly to. Let's pray together. Lord, you created us to live in relationships, from marriages to friendships to family to the body of Christ. And God, I know in my own world, man, relationships can be one of the greatest stressors. Constant barrage of thoughts in my heads, arguments, disagreements. And God, I just pray over our church that we would be united, that above our thoughts and our feelings, that in our relationships, in our marriages, in the relationships that we have with everyone, that we would make every effort to do whatever it takes to keep the peace in the unity. We need your help. In Jesus' name, amen.